aim plan. We've just had the CPI data hit. I'm going to go in depth on that. We have stocks moving, crypto moving, and gold starting to make maybe a little bit of a pullback. So let's get right into it here as we go. See what we have on the radar here as we get right into the action. Let's talk this CPI data out, okay? So first and foremost, CPI data is inflation news, all right? So it's it's the consumer side. So it's what you and I feel when we go out to the store when we're buying goods. Always remember that. There's PPI, which is producer side, and there's CPI, which is consumer side. So this is the consumer side. CPI year over year comes in at 3.2%. That is hotter than forecast. So again, hotter than forecast previous was 3.1 percent so again one tenth hotter than expected cpi month over month comes in at expectations of 0.4 but that is still higher than the 0.3 percent from last month core core cpi year over year comes in hotter as well 3.8 percent versus forecast 3.7 percent last month was 3.9 percent and core CPI month over month comes in hotter as well at 0.4% versus 0.3% forecast. Now this is the kicker guys. There's no no doubt that inflation, this is the second month in a row that CPI data has been hotter than expected. Now, the kicker here is that, yes, CPI is down substantially from the highs, obviously, over the last year, but it's becoming sticky. And sticky is going to be a thorn in the side of the Federal Reserve. Because, again, I was even talking about this with other traders yesterday. Imagine if, let's say, CPI starts inching back to, let's say, 3.5 to 4%. So, again, you have inflation at 3.5 to 4%. Right now, it's hovering in the low threes. But if that happens, how does the Fed cut interest rates substantially if we see a recession? Now, if we have a perfect soft landing, no problem at all. The Fed can stay diligent. But again, for me at least, this is a concern and this is what I predicted. A year ago, I said, listen, when you go from 9% per, 9 CPI or 9% inflation down to three, that's the easy part. The hard part is the last little bit from three to two. And again, best example for those of you that work out, I've tried this before. You know, for me, getting in shape at the gym, doing all the weights, doing all the crunches, everything looked good except my abs. I couldn't get my six pack at all when I was younger. And again, that was the last little bit. That's like trying to go that extra mile to get in that perfect shape. That's what CPI dropping it from three to 2% is. Now, the kicker here is you would say, oh, well, shouldn't the markets be falling substantially? And the answer is not necessarily. And this has surprised me just a little bit. Initially, so this is the S&P futures, right, or essentially pre-market spiders. Initially, what we saw was an initial drop because it was hotter. Then the markets ripped up, which to me, I'm like, what the heck? Like, this is not good news. But this is the kicker, guys. If we look at what we are seeing in the Fed Funds uh, watch tool, let me flip back to that real quick. If we look at this, what we're seeing is that this did not change expectations for a Fed rate cut in June. So I think the market initially was rejoicing that the markets are still pricing in over a 60% chance of a Fed rate cut in June. And again, overall, is this bad news for those of us that want low interest rates and essentially more printing of money? Well, yes, it is bad news. It's not good news for the Fed, but it doesn't change the ultimate outcome of a June rate cut in terms of expectations, at least not as of yet. So that's something that I think is why the markets initially, after the quick little flush, which was algorithm-based, we then saw buyers coming in because they were still seeing this number stay with a June rate cut. Now, again, this is going to change expectations because, again, we can go out to obviously next March. This is March of 2025, and we're still at a 4, 4 to 4.25 interest rate. So, again, if you look at where the 10 year is trading right now, it's basically in that 4 percentage range. And that means that even into 2025, interest rates are likely not going to be any lower than that. So, again, overall, I take this as a negative, I take this as bad news. If we flip back to this, we can start to see that the markets are starting to say, wait a minute, this is not the best. Even though we're still net positive on the day, I'm curious to see where we end up. All right, back to a couple other things here on the headline front here as we flip back. Let's go back to our data points and scroll down. What we do have here, guys, is Oracle. So Oracle is one of the positives. In fact, yesterday after hours, we saw markets moving up, especially technology stocks, because Oracle 
Google came out and beat earnings handily and is trading up about 13% pre-market. We'll do a check on that. We'll look for trading levels in just a minute. But basically, they said that AI demand and cloud demand, those are the positives here. So again, that helped them beat on earnings, and the stock obviously is reacting to that. Now, we know that NVIDIA has been down two days in a row, so we'll see if that bucks the trend. NVIDIA is positive, but it seems like any sort of mention of AI gets those stocks kind of initiating to try to push back up. I'm just skeptical after that reversal engulfing candle that I taught yesterday on NVIDIA's chart. Can we actually see NVIDIA make a new high or is the top in? All right, a couple other things here, guys. Uh, homeowners, this is an interesting headline that I wanted to pass along to you. I do my best to find these ones that maybe the big media outlets are not reporting to you, but I do think it kind of gives us insight into the consumer and the citizens of the world. Homeowners are increasingly tapping into the equity in their homes to keep their spending habits up. Home equity lines of credit and second lien mortgages are jumping. So what this tells me, folks, is that during the pandemic, people had excess savings. They started to live life more lavishly. They would go out to eat more. They'd buy more things. They'd kind of live up to what they were saving. Well, the problem is, is that as we saw inflation rage higher, people started to say, wait a minute, this is tough to keep up paying this, and they started to spend all of the savings down. So savings went up during the pandemic. It's now gone negative, and we're seeing it come down dramatically. And they're saying, essentially, what, what's going on here is people are saying, Saying, listen, I don't want to change my spending habits yet. I still think the economy is going to be okay because the Fed tells us this, because the government tells us this, even though they're the ones printing money, they probably know better. But nonetheless, they're then saying, well, listen, I'll tap a home equity line of credit to keep this going, to keep my spending habits as they are until the economy gets better. My fear is that the economy is not going to get better, folks. I, I believe we are going towards that recession later this year. And again, there's many metrics. I've talked about U6 with you guys, U6 unemployment. I've talked about other metrics as well. There are lots of signals, including this one, that tells me the consumer is stretched. And again, the kicker is this, is that if we don't, if they're taking out additional loans and we see the economy crater, it means more defaults and more problems for the banks later on. We know that the bank based on the commercial real estate issues are already having issues. All right, lastly here, a couple things. Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, says the Fed may want to wait until after June. It's almost as if, and this headline was before the CPI number, almost as if he knew ahead of time that that CPI was going to be hot. But right now, as we said, markets are still pricing in a June cut. Lastly, AONON falls 13% on earnings. We'll take a look at that. It's about a $10 billion market cap company, so it's not too small. It's worth taking a look at. All right, so let's get into some charting action here on this beautiful Tuesday. And again, thank you guys for joining me. Just a quick check back in on the spiders. Look, the spiders have almost negated. Look at this pullback. So we've almost come back to this level. Now, the kicker is this, guys. Check this daily chart out. So yesterday, you guys know, I feel like I'm almost famous for this wedge pattern at this point. I've been pointing this wedge out for the last two months, probably, how we were inside of this wedge saying that, listen, when the market finally breaks down from this, that's where you get your big corrective move. Well, guess what? Yesterday, we were below the line, and they rescued the market into the end of the day and closed us back on or above the line. So in this case, the S&P was safe as of yesterday. We need to see what happens today with this CPI data as it pans out throughout the day. But essentially, any close below this line is a warning sign. And then what I taught you yesterday and what I've taught you in these game plans is to watch for confirmation. Speaking of confirmation, if we flip over to the NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ 100 officially confirmed a break. All right, so again, just to reiterate, here we closed below, didn't confirm. Here we closed below, didn't confirm. They pushed us back up, just like over here. Uh, two days ago, or I should say on Friday, on Friday we closed below, and yesterday we had that secondary lower close below the low of the previous session, which again means this is a confirmed breakdown. Now let's talk about confirmed breakdowns. What does this mean? Well, essentially what it means is that you now have probabilities that have swayed towards the negative side for the NASDAQ 100. And also that goes with the vibe of what we've seen in the charts of the semis with the reversal SMH, uh, engulfing candle, NVIDIA, um, GE. We saw lots of these topping tails develop as of last Friday as well. So again, a confirmed move, it doesn't mean it's a guarantee.
key. Please understand that. It's all, everything I do is probabilities. I'm an odds maker, basically, in trading. And what we're doing here is we're saying that now the tides have shift, shifted from trending up to now the probabilities are will trend down. Now, could we still go up and get back into this zone? Yes, but the odds of that are significantly lower than what a breakdown would likely or essentially getting a breakdown. All right, so I always stress that because I think, again, there's so many kind of, you know, you know, people out there that, that generally they hear me say one thing is likely and they say, oh, well, he's saying it's 100%. Nothing in the markets is 100%. If it was 100%, I'd be making zillions of dollars versus, again, making money trading markets, but obviously, you know, still having losses. There's no doubt about it. Okay. All right, so that's one of the things we want to go over there. Looking at the U.S. dollar, we can see the dollar is starting to grind higher on the daily chart. Again, this dollar moving up is usually the negative. My guess is we saw, we've seen a move up over the last 30 minutes since the stock market S&P started to curl over because you have an inverse relationship. Remember the relationship here on the dollar. When the dollar goes up, markets generally pull back. So you see a green candle here, and we're seeing, again, pre-market as the markets are rolling over. And let's flip to the intraday chart and just confirm confirm that here. Uh, yep, look at that. So just in the last couple candles, the dollar started to push up, which then coincides if we flip back to the spiders 10 minute with the pullback here in the S&P. So you see that inverse relationship at work. Next, let's take a look at the 10 year yield. Well, that's the 10 year yield as well. Uh, I might've been actually looking at the 10 year yield. It's still the same thing though. Yields are pushing up a little bit. Here's the dollar again, pushing up same sort of inverse correlation. So again, yields go up, markets go down. Uh, dollar goes up, markets go down. That correlation continues. All right, couple things to look at here. Let's take a look at Oracle. Oracle reports earnings yesterday after the bell. The stock surges. This morning at four in the morning, we had this crazy, I don't know who bought up here, but someone obviously, some shares exchanged hands at 4 a.m. Eastern time. And then it's come back in to basically be in alignment with where it was trading yesterday in the after hours. Uh, it is down ticking a little bit at 127.20. So where would a technical level be on this chart? Let's zoom out on the chart. I'm actually gonna flip to the weekly here because I wanna get a bigger picture. So the first thing I see when I look at this chart, chart, first thing I see is that you kind of were getting consolidation, right? We kind of had this bigger up move. Here's your flag pattern, right? So there you have your flag, and that was actually a little bit of bullish consolidation, and now we obviously see the stock trading up in this range at 127. The other thing to keep an eye on is very clearly, we have a pivot top at 127, which makes sense why the stock is trading there, right? So again, pivot high right here, pivot high right here, connect those lines, and that's pretty much exactly where the stock is trading. Now, would I short it here? No way, no way. I don't like shorting at levels that are being seen pre-market. I wanna find that when emotion takes over, let's say short covering at the open, if a stock continues to surge up and gets irrational, that's when I wanna jump on board. And again, as a trader, as a short-term investor, and day trader. That's how I live, right? I live on emotional reactions in stocks that create opportunities for either longs or shorts. So when people get too bullish one side and get too crazy, I start to say, okay, listen, this is getting a little out of control and I go the opposite way. And when people get too fearful and they're panicking and they're throwing things up in the air and I look at the company, I say, listen, let me use my logical brain to focus in. Is there value here? And if the answer is, yes, once that panic subsides, you'll see a natural tendency for that stock or that crypto to come back up. So that's the kicker here of understanding kind of the game that I play on a daily basis with trading, both day trading and swing trading. Now, if you're a long investor, all you focus on is the long term, right? You're like, where is this going to be in 10, 20 years? That's fine. That's just not what I do as a trader. Okay. So again, let's just talk about Oracle here. If we zoom out on the charts, the first thing I'm seeing is that there's really no, I mean, once we get above 127 on this, there's really not any levels per se that would get my attention. But if we do this, this is kind of more my style where I look at the big time frame. I'm now on the monthly chart. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking the highs from the dot com bubble right here. I'm connecting them to this 2000 and high level. And what do I get? I get a 133 approximate resistance. So now today in my head, I say, okay, well, if it were to push up, irrationally, let's say, into 133, there may be a shortable opportunity there that may be a top in the stock in the near term. Now, again, long term, 
Who knows? And honestly, I don't care because, frankly, I'm a shorter term trader. That's how I do my thing. All right. So anyways, that gives us a level to guide us to maybe resistance. Speaking of that longer term trend line, do take a look at the, the NASDAQ 100 here. Same trend line on the NASDAQ and look at what's going on. Here's your dot com bubble high connected to your 2022 high, and here we are right at that level. So do you guys see how you just saw that daily chart on the NASDAQ 100 break down and confirm? We just talked about that a couple minutes ago, right? Now we're looking at a bigger time frame, which now shows a major trend line up here, which also gives me additional confidence that the NASDAQ 100, let's say and on a monthly chart, you're looking now at the next six to 12 months, this is likely going to be a confluence of a pullback scenario, and again, as a trader, one of the best things you can do is find multiple time frames that confirm the indicators that you're looking at. So you look at a, a monthly, a weekly, a daily, even a 10 minute or a 60 minute chart, and if you can find multiple factors like negative divergences on all those time frames, that's a very powerful signal that you're coming to some sort of reversal to the downside. And we do have that on the NASDAQ 100. All right. So let's continue on here, guys, as we go through. Uh, we'll take a look at ONON here, which again is on holdings. We can see it is trading down pretty sharply here. Looks like it traded around one, uh, 35 bucks. Now it's trading at 27 and three quarters. And if we flip to the daily chart, one of the things that I do here is I just start to say, okay, 27 and three quarters is right around this area. I don't see any sort of decent support here, but I do see a bottom pivot right here, right? So this low to this low right here. So that's going to be my zone to watch. Now, I'm not sure. I'll have to reevaluate this um, in real time today. But what I would say is, in general, 26 to 25 looks to be a significant support level down here. And again, we have this level and this level. And obviously, if we get in that zone, that will, should be. And I say should because there's no guarantees. We know that. But that should be some sort of technical support. Okay. Couple other things here, guys. Uh, I know I'm running a little short on time, so you know what? Let's quickly take a quick 30 second break, center camera here, and we're gonna just quickly hear from iTrust Capital, who's freaking rock stars. What they're giving you guys in terms of crypto opportunities and IRAs is amazing. So here's a 30 second break. All right, guys, we're back. Let's look at Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is basically hasn't moved much since yesterday. Again, interesting to still see it hovering around that 72,000 level. Again, in terms of where this could go, you can look at upside and downside scenarios. I'm going to watch the weekly close on Bitcoin. Does it close back below this pivot high as last week did, right? So that's a key level that I'm watching. That's just above 69,000. All right, but right now it is squarely above that level. If you're talking about opportunities where you could see this thing going, to let's talk some upside right so again all the bulls out there will be super happy to talk about this bulls bullish case scenario there's two ways to figure this out okay so again to do your figuring out, what we're going to do here is essentially look at this and what we can do is we could take the low of the last cycle right down here right so if we take the low of this last cycle bear with me as I get my drawing tool back up there it was right in this range right around that you know, what was it, $3,000 level. So 3,000, the high of the bull cycle, the last bull cycle was 69,000. If you take that difference, right? So if we take that difference and we add it to the low of this bull cycle, it's about a $65,000, $66,000 addition. You essentially get $81,000 up here. That's your bull case in terms of what's called a measured move. Now, the other way to do it would also be taking this high here and connecting it to his. Now, generally, I like to have three pivot points to connect a trend line to because you get more a firm line. Um, usually when you connect just two, you can be off a little bit. And when you map it out over like this, it becomes very kind of like, okay, is that is that really at that price or am I off by five or 10,000? But just by doing that, if you do the best you can, you essentially get approximately an $88,000 target. So the idea is 81, right, to 88, 
that would be significant resistance if it were to go there. Now, again, I still have resistance at around 75. That'll be an interesting level, and I'm still watching the daily close, but I'm just trying to give you guys a balanced view of where it could potentially go if risk on stays. Now, I'll tell you this. If we do see a drop in the markets, let's say we're talking stock market here, let's say we get a 30, 40% uh, uh, drop in the NASDAQ 100, I would think that Bitcoin in the very least goes back to that 30 to 32,000 level, which was this previous breakout zone right in here. So it's still on the table. And again, a good trader looks at all sides of the coin, right? And then you pick your side based on probabilities. And again, that's what I've done as a trader for a long time. I know if the stock market drops, this is my downside first target. If the stock market just continues to rip and let's say the NASDAQ 100 keeps breaking through, well, then you probably could head up maybe as high as 80 to 85, 89,000 dollars on Bitcoin, all right? And again, a lot of you guys talk about, oh, well, the, the ETFs are buying, the spot ETFs and all this institution. Well, yeah, right now they are. But remember, that works both ways. So if you do get an equity, a stock market drop, what is going to happen? We're going to see a lot of players exiting and selling because they're going to get scared in the spot ETFs. A lot of people think everyone's a maxi. Not everyone's a maxi. A lot of these people getting into the spot ETFs are actually shorter term or they do get skittish very, very easily. So just remember that. Uh, quickly looking at a couple others, I just want to show this one, Avalanche. Avalanche is an interesting chart here. It's hitting resistance right up here, $49 to $50. You have a double top right here, and you also have this parallel trend line, so that will be resistance there. And then quickly, just to go over, and I'll do more commodities tomorrow, guys, but again, I am running out of time here. We are seeing gold pull back. I even said to you guys yesterday that I thought gold was due for a pullback. I told you I unloaded a lot of my gold positions as a shorter-term trader. What am I looking for? I'm looking for a retrace back into this zone here, and then I start buying again. I might even start buying a little early, like right in this range but again sold up here now looking to rebuy here as a swing trader long term i love gold but again doesn't mean i'm not going to swing trade it when there's opportunities when i think it's going to pull back why would i stay in it if it's going to pull back why don't i just get a better price that's the skill level i have not everyone has that skill level all right last thing quickly oil guys not much new on oil here just continuing to consolidate below 79 breakout level and natural gas getting a small bounce today just to the upside all right real quick guys as we get in here I want to just say again, as always, guys, thank you guys so much for the support, the love, the comments. Uh, the comments every day warm my heart, so thank you so much. I appreciate you tuning in, and I love that I'm hearing you guys learning so much. So have a great rest of your day. I'll be back bright and early, 9 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Take care.